There we go. Yeah, sometimes it does that thing where it, it like doesn't auto record. So always fun. <laughs> <clears throat> So wait just a couple minutes uh, while we get all our participants here. Sounds good. So one feature that I, I wish that Zoom would have is like background music. Yeah, agreed. Um, <laughs> for like the first like minute or two while people people come in and so. We'll just give it another minute here. It looks like we're about uh, about 20 people, 20 people uh, awesome. here, so. Sounds good. I know the music feature would be really great. That would yeah, be, just, yeah. You can have like sound idea. effects or something too, in addition to, yeah. things, you know? <laughs> exactly. Really step like it up a notch. Cartoon sound effects, you know? Exactly. That sort of thing, so. <laughs> <laughs> Would have been fun on a lot of the family Zooms during COVID. Oh, totally, sure. totally. The funny hats and, you know. Yep. Um, awesome. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Christopher Jack. Uh, you can call me CJ. and I'm one of the partnerships managers uh, here at Polygence. And uh, really for the next hour, um, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, just um, uh, the cancer biology field with uh, one of our amazing mentors, uh, Selena Lori, um, we'll be talking about her experience uh, as a cancer biologist. Um, so in terms of what we'll be talking about uh, for the next hour, so I'm going to uh, introduce Selena, and then uh, she's going to provide a cancer biology overview. Um, Selena's going to talk about her journey um, from high school to a PhD candidate. And uh, of course, she'll be talking about her experience um, as a mentor here at Polygence and um, uh, just, you know, her experience, um, you know, being mentored uh, along her journey um, to uh, Duke University. And then uh, at the end, I'll talk a little bit about next steps for those students who are interested in applying uh, to Polygence. So the format of this webinar is an Ask Me Anything. So truly at any time, feel free to jump in with any questions. You don't have to wait till the end of the webinar uh, to ask those questions. Um, so uh, I'll be asking questions to, uh, questions to Selena uh, throughout the webinar, but again, feel free to jump in at any time uh, with questions that you have uh, about uh, cancer biology. So uh, with that said, I would like to introduce uh, Selena Laurie. Awesome, thanks CJ. Um, so hey everybody, my name is Selena. Um, I'm currently a fifth year PhD student at Duke University down in Durham, North Carolina. And I've been in, as I said, my graduate studies for about five years now. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview of sort of what I did before that. And then we can kind of launch into more about the cancer bio field. Um, if you're wondering why I'm studying something called immunology, but talking about something called cancer biology. I actually study um, brain cancer specifically, and I study how um, we can harness the power of the immune system to fight cancer. And that's a, a therapy called immunotherapy. It's actually a group of treatments. And so I'm happy to answer questions about that. But sort of the, the focus of my project right now as a researcher, as a PhD student, is to understand why patients with brain tumors have um, such weakened or suppressed immune systems and how we can overcome that weakened immune system in order to get some of these treatments that harness the power of the immune system to actually work in brain tumor patients because they work in patients with other types of cancers like skin cancer, which you may have heard of um, as melanoma or lung cancer. So that's sort of the focus of my work right now. Um, before starting my PhD at Duke, I spent two years up in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, working as a research research technician in the cancer center at Mass General Hospital. And I'll talk a little bit more about my time there. I worked for someone called Marcella Moss. She was a phenomenal mentor of mine. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, why mentoring is so important, particularly in this field and, and how it's impacted sort of my journey. Um, but she really supported my 
um, my endeavors in, in research and sort of led me here to Duke. Um, before uh, working for her, I was an undergrad at Bowdoin College up in Brunswick, Maine. I am a native Mainer and I lived there my entire life until moving to Boston after I graduated, but I graduated from Bowdoin College back in 2016 and I majored in biology. So I knew that I had a love of biology and, and human health and um, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about my experience there as well. Um, so I talked to you a little bit about my research as well, but I, during college, I did a couple of internships. Um, I also worked at Thermo Fisher Scientific out in San Francisco. So I've kind of been all over the place with research um, in terms of geographically. And then I also worked in Boston at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. If you ever see this, this is just a pro tip. Uh, that word B-R-O-A-D is pronounced Broad. Um, that is how you say the Research Institute. When I interviewed there, I called it the Broad Institute. So pro tip for anybody who was looking for, uh, for internships there in the future. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of the brief overview of, of what I'm doing now. And I'm happy to talk to you about the field that I'm really passionate about. So thank you so much, Selena. Yeah. So I, I'm going to jump right in with a couple of questions. And okay. um, can you talk a little bit about what exactly is cancer biology? Because you mentioned, yeah. um, and I keep butchering this name, immuno, immunology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> keep, like, for some reason, I cannot say that word. But there's so, okay. there's so many different branches of mm -hmm. cancer biology. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, I think you you really hit the nail on the head there. So I would say cancer biology is sort of a general term um, for, you know, lots of different parts of the field. Um, you'll also hear it called oncology. Um, that's usually more of sort of the medical terminology, but I would say cancer biology is, is more analogous to doing cancer research. And so um, within that field, there's kind of like two main branches, one being the focus on the tumor cells themselves, um, and one being, uh, I guess, more than two, but the, the other main one uh, would be the focus on the immune system. And I study the immune system as a whole and how it relates to cancer. But basically, you, you kind of have the choice. You can focus on um, cancer biology is, is basically looking at this group of diseases. And I think that we often think about cancer as one disease and we talk about finding a cure for cancer, right? But this is actually, you know, many, many, many different diseases, right? So melanoma, this aggressive form of lung cancer, uh, excuse me, of skin cancer is very different from lung cancer, which is very different from brain cancer. Um, and you can develop cancer in, in many different parts of the body. And these are all very different diseases that, um, are, are treated different ways and respond to different types of therapies. So the study of cancer biology, you know, you can, you can study a certain treatment for cancer and you can apply that across different types of cancer. You can study one cancer and understand, you know, sort of what's happening in the setting of that tumor. So that's, you know, one side of the field really looks at the, the, the commonality between, um, all of these things, all of these sort of sets of diseases that we call cancer is this uncontrolled cell growth. Um, and so you can study the cells themselves and ask why are they growing uncontrollably and how can we stop them? Or you can say, what can we use to fight off these cells? Some people use the immune system, which is sort of where my work sits. Some people use chemotherapy, radiation, different types of targeted treatments to help patients. So that's sort of the, the general view of the field. There's a lot of different things that you can do, but I think everybody in the cancer research and cancer biology field is there because they want to help people. Yeah. Got it. Uh, and, 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 you know, I think the second question I think is so, um, uh, I think it's kind of obvious, this idea of helping <laughs> people um, yeah. outside of, of, you know, that being sort of the, the crux of uh, what I would assume why you decided to, to go down the path of cancer biology. What Absolutely. are some other reasons why cancer biology um, is an exciting field? Yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways that this can be applied. Like I said, there are, you know, many different types of cancers. So you sort of have the spectrum of patients who we have treatments that are 
very effective in these patients. Um, and that the type of cancer that I study is called glioblastoma. It's a really aggressive form of brain cancer. That's sort of on the other end of the spectrum. We really don't have too many treatments. And so I think um, being able to do something meaningful to help people is interesting and, and you know, very fulfilling. And I think also it's, it's an exciting field because there are so many different ways um, that you can interact with this field. Like I said, I'm, I'm an immunologist by training, which means I study the immune system. And so the way that I interact with the cancer biology field is asking how we can harness the power of the immune system to fight off cancer. And so traditionally, many of the treatments for cancer like chemotherapy and radiation, <clears throat> I like to sort of generally think about them, although they're you know, very useful and very important to treat patients. I think about chemotherapy as trying to sort of poison the tumor and radiation as trying to burn it away. And so the way that the cancer field as a whole is moving is trying to develop um, more targeted treatments that are going to have fewer side effects. And instead of sort of targeting the whole body, they target just the tumor and they try to get rid of the cancer specifically instead of harm other parts of the body as well. And so I think it's really interesting. It's an interesting mix of sort of cell biology, molecular biology, you get to apply a lot of techniques um, and, and sort of bring these different ideas and fields together to say, how can we create better treatments? We try to, in, in my lab and my project, I'm trying to understand some of the challenges that these brain tumor patients are going through and then using that understanding, create better treatments for them. So I find it very exciting. What about yeah. the career paths? Because there are, and this kind of gets into that, that last question there um, mm -hmm. about the difference between PhD and MD. So, you, you know, yeah, you're more absolutely. than welcome to sort of answer uh, both questions at the same time. But um, cool. if I'm an aspiring, you know, if I'm interested in cancer biology and, um, you know, I, I'm considering, the career options. I mean, I imagine there's got to be yeah. so many different areas of research that, you know, you could become a doctor. Yeah. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, absolutely. There is a ton that you can do. I think if you're someone who's interested in helping people and you're particularly interested in cancer, this is a phenomenal field. There's a lot of work to be done and there's a lot of um, opportunities to do that work. And so I kind of included these pictures. These are pictures of me and my colleagues um, from different points in my career. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to just talk through what some of them are doing. And so if you start on the bottom, um, this is three of my colleagues that I worked with in um, when I was at Mass General Hospital. And on the far left, um, actually both, both of the women on the far left now work, um, they moved from Boston to San Francisco and they work at a um, biotech company that is focused on um, creating new treatments for patients with cancer. The one on the far left did a postdoc or a postdoctoral fellowship before this. So she got her PhD and then she stayed in research after her PhD and did another training session um, for several years before moving into what we call industry. There's sort of the big divide is industry versus academia. Do you wanna stay in research, work at a university, run your own lab, or do you wanna move and work for a company? Um, something like a biotech company or an in, or a, a pharmaceutical company. Um, so both of them went to um, to a biotech company, and they're they're working on new treatments. But um, one went right from her PhD, uh, and one did a, a postdoctoral fellowship after her PhD. So these are both training opportunities to prepare you um, to either run your own lab or to move into biotech or a pharmaceutical company. The person on the right side of that, all the way to the right is me, but the person next to me um, is actually from Denmark and she was here as a visiting scholar in our lab and she currently runs her own lab um, over in Denmark. So that's another path that you can take is she was doing her PhD during this time. So after your PhD, instead of going to industry like a, a pharmaceutical or biotech company, you can stay in academia as we say um, and you can work typically as a postdoctoral fellow, you have another um, training experience, and then you um, sort of, you can apply for different grants to try to get funding for your research. 
and you can work for a university and have your own research lab. Um, you can also work for a hospital or sometimes there are institutes like the Broad Institute I told you about. Um, there are a number of, of cancer centers that you can work for as well doing research that interests you. And I think some of the, you know, one of the major reasons why people stay in academia, I think, is because you get that flexibility to say, this is the part of cancer biology that I'm interested in, and I want to run my lab. I want to have people working on the problems that I'm really interested in. And I think a lot of people go into industry because um, they, they get a chance to be more translational, which means that they get to apply their research to patients in a much faster way. So it kind of just depends, you know, what you're interested in. Um, on the right, the, the picture on the bottom right um, is my current colleague and me. Um, we are all geared up in our personal protective equipment to do an experiment. And the person on the left side of that photo um, is an MD PhD student. And so he is receiving his PhD, which is a research degree. It's a terminal degree. It's the highest degree you can receive um, in, in a specific field, um, in the research setting. And so, you know, I do a lot of work with animal models. We do a lot of work with cell culture, things like that in the setting of, of, uh, cancer biology. And he's also getting his MD, which means he is getting a, um, a medical degree where he will be able to also treat patients. And so his career goal is to both do research in the lab that's gonna help patients and then also run a clinical practice where he is seeing those patients. And so people who choose to do the dual MD PhD degrees um, can both treat patients when you have an MD and also do research, which is with a PhD. They're technically both doctorates, but one you can treat patients and one you cannot. So if you have an MD, you can see patients. And then I just wanted to include a picture of um, the person on the top as well. She is also in my PhD lab. Um, her goal is to move into, um, move into industry and work at a biotech company. But I wanted to share that um, I told you that I went to undergrad and then I worked for two years um, in between as a research tech. And then I went to graduate school. She went right from her undergrad um, into graduate school and started her PhD you know, a couple of months after she graduated from undergrad. So you kind of have the option of doing either if you decide that you want to do an MD or a PhD and get a doctorate. And I also wanted to include that photo because I wanted to highlight that I think from all of these, you get really close to the people that you work with in lab. And that it's a really intellectually engaging and exciting field where you get to help people. It can be very difficult at times because you're running experiments that don't always work. Um, but it is fulfilling because you are, you know, trying to, to ultimately create better treatments for patients. But I think from a personal side of things, it also gives you the opportunity to, to bond quite a bit with your colleagues. You're working long hours with them. Um, and I've created, I think, some really, really strong and meaningful friendships um, from my experiences uh, throughout my research career. So I just wanted to highlight that as well. I'm so glad you included those pictures because they're... You know, we, we think about um, careers and, and you know, uh, just sort of what that looks like. There is a human element to yeah. the experience, and um, you make a lot of connections along the way, regardless of uh, the career path that you choose. Um, yeah. Uh, there, there's a, a couple of great questions here. Um, awesome. So I'm going to start with the second one. Uh, Bella um, asks, what does it mean to run your own lab? Oh, great question, Bella. Um, so to run your own lab means that you are the we call it a PI, it's a principal investigator. That means that you are the person who gets to decide what the lab is going to study. So to give you some context, I told you that I'm a PhD student, I'm getting my doctorate, I do research, but I work for someone else. So I work within a lab and the person who's the head of the lab is the person who's called the PI or the principal investigator. His job is to get funding for the lab, whether through grants from the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, private foundations. Um, there are also other ways to, to get funding through the university um, or other um, uh, national funding opportunities. But basically, his job is to decide what directions we want to take the lab. For example, 
um, my, my, the head of my lab is actually an MD PhD. He's a neurosurgeon who also does brain cancer research. So he decided our research is going to be focused on how do we use the immune system to fight brain cancer? He could have decided that our research was going to be on, you know, melanoma, right? Aggressive form of skin cancer, but he does brain surgery. That's what he does with his, with his patients in the clinic. And so he decided that he wanted to focus on, um, on brain tumors and how to harness the power of the immune system to fight off those tumors and why that doesn't work well. And so running your own lab, I think is exciting because you get to decide what the important questions are, how you want to help people and how you want to answer that. And then you get to bring people into your lab, like graduate students, like me, um, research techs, um, postdoc, uh, postdocs or postdoctoral fellows, like you're, I was telling you about, you get to bring in a bunch of people who are going to do that research with you and try to help answer those questions. So that's a great question. I actually have a follow-up question to that. And, and you yeah. talked about um, NIH funding. And mm -hmm. um, uh, so I'm just loosely familiar with how that works. Now, uh, I know it's a lot of money. Uh, we're talking mm -hmm. like millions and millions of dollars. I don't know what the NIH budget is, but it's I know yeah. it's a lot. Does the funding source dictate the research or does the research like idea sort of dictate the funding? Does that make sense as a, as a question? Yeah, so it's kind of both. So there are different sort of like bins of money, like where you can pull from. And so you would submit a grant. So you basically write up this paper saying, this is the question. These are the types of questions I want to answer. This is how I'm going to answer it. This is why I'm prepared to answer it. Like I have the, you know, we have the expertise in our lab. We have the appropriate equipment. We have a plan. We know, you know, we, we can design experiments with proper controls to actually answer the questions. And then you submit that paper to the NIH or wherever you're trying to get funding. And at something like the NIH with federal funding, depending on um, what your, your lab is focused on, so like all of the cancer um, applications might go to one place, whereas let's say you work on um, COVID or autoimmune diseases or something else, they're gonna go somewhere else. And it's actually people who run labs um, that are also responsible, like a couple times a year, they'll go to the NIH or now you can do it remotely um, after COVID. They have these things called study sections where they basically review all of those papers, all of those grants, and they score them based on who's the best and, and who is the most impactful, who's gonna help people the most, what the best science is, things like that. Um, and then the very top percentage of those grants actually get the funding. So you're basically saying, here's why you should fund my lab and fund my idea. Does that make sense? Totally. Cool. That's a great explanation. Awesome. Um, a couple of questions here. I, there's um, yeah. two that I think we'll be able to get to in, in um, the next couple of slides, but uh, Karthik had a question um, yeah. about, um, I'll actually just read the whole thing verbatim. Uh, congratulations and best wishes yeah. on your research. Uh, my son has already joined Polygen and wants to do some research in biology. Based on your yeah. experience, do you have any suggestions on how a high school student can get access to a biology lab to do some experiments as part of his research? Yeah, great question. I think um, I have two thoughts about this. One is that obviously I am a mentor for Polygen and I think that um, experiments can be pretty difficult uh, as, as someone who does a lot of them. Uh, they often don't work the first or second or third time. And so I would say, um, you know, one of the things that I am excited about for my students is teaching them how to sort of think about designing experiments and how to think about some of these big questions. And so that's sort of where I focus with my students is like, what are the pressing questions in the field? But I think if you're interested in learning more about the actual lab side of things, one of the things that I did in high school was actually reach out. So I just as a caveat, I grew up in a really small town in Maine. Um, there were 63 kids in my high school graduating class. So we had labs, but they were very, very small. Um, so this basically my point is that this can be done anywhere. Um, I reached out to a local hospital and I asked if I could shadow in the lab. So I couldn't actually, you know, get a lot of hands-on training, but I was able to um, to shadow the people who were doing 
experiments in the lab and who were, you know, testing patient blood and things like that and see how things were done and learn a lot about the vocabulary um, of, of being in a lab and, and learning sort of what things looked like and how they worked. And that would be my recommendation if you really want to get some sort of hands-on, you know, in lab training. I think a lot of, you know, it was much easier to do than I thought. Obviously you have a lot of paperwork you have to go through because you're in a hospital, you have to sign confidentiality, things like that. But they were very, very open to having a student come in. I think I went like once a week for a semester. So that would be my, um, that would be my uh, piece of advice. I think another thing is if you have a, a college or university in your town, um, you can reach out, you can, you know, go online if you're interested in cancer biology or whatever you're interested in. Um, Google some of the people at the university and their emails will be there. Send them an email and say, hey, I'm really interested in your work. I'm really interested in this. Can I shadow in the lab? That's another option. I think typically high schoolers are not um, doing their own experiments only because it takes a lot of work to be trained in the lab. And like I said, you know, even for someone who's been doing this for a decade, a lot of times experiments just do not work the first, second, third time you do them. So it takes a pretty big time commitment, um, unfortunately. But yeah, you can always do like a review paper too, right? So even if yeah. you don't have access to a lab, you can so do a review paper and still, um, you know, it can still be high impact, especially if it's the first time or second time you've done research as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, that's what a lot of my students have done. And I, I find that particularly exciting because what I think that does is that sets the students up to have an understanding of the field as a whole and what some of these exciting um, questions are that are sort of coming up so that when you get into college and you're looking for internships or, you know, you're trying to get a sense of, well, you know, what, what, why is this field cool? Or what, what, how can the immune system do anything with cancer? What does this mean? You can sort of know what these big driving questions of the field are. And that's sort of where I have my, you know, that's, that's what my students have wanted to focus on. Um, and I think that, you know, my understanding is that they've all been very excited about learning about this. And so I think if they decide to pursue that in college, they'll, they'll, you know, um, be ready to go and, and jump into the lab work. Cause I think a lot of that is learning specific techniques versus, you know, having some big picture questions. And so we focus on sort of the big picture. Yeah. Great. We're going to go to the next slide there. We have a couple more questions that have come in, but um, I want to get to the next slide just because we're, we're almost at the halfway mark. Um, awesome. And these, by the way, these are great, great questions. So, so please uh, keep them coming. Um, so, Kalina, I, I wonder if you'd like to just talk a little bit about your, um, it, just your journey to, mm -hmm. like, what sparked your interest initially to where you are now? Yeah, good question. Um, I fell in love with biology I, in high school, um, didn't really know what it was, was always interested in science, um, didn't know what I wanted to do when I grew up, basically, um, but I sat in my first biology class and I was just blown away by basically all of the course material. And I think also the teacher that I had was absolutely phenomenal. So I think that goes back to having excellent mentors really, really makes an impact on your life and your career. Um, in terms of cancer biology specifically, I knew I wanted to do something. I thought I wanted to do something in cancer. Um, I think I, I had a couple realizations. One was that basically everybody that I knew, and I think everybody in general um, has been impacted by cancer in one way or another, pretty, pretty dramatically. Um, and, and I knew that I was really interested in biology. I thought cells were really interesting. I didn't really know what I could do with that interest, but I sort of made a mission statement for myself where I said, I wanna use my skills and knowledge that I had at the time and any skills and knowledge that I had acquired to help people. And I decided that cancer biology and cancer research was the best way that I could do that. And I sort of have lived with the lived sort of by the motto um, that I want to use my skills and knowledge to help people. And I and I, you know, have just kind of followed that path. And that's been my my guide of the the value of wanting to do something um, meaningful and fulfilling. And so I think I would really encourage you know, I would encourage everybody who's interested in something to think about how might this fulfill you? I think it's not always going to make you happy. As I said, like there are times experiments don't work and it's frustrating and that's going to be true in every field. Like there are going to be frustrating things, but you know, what do you find fulfilling? For me, it was 
doing something that's going to make the lives of cancer patients and their families better. That was my goal. So I think if that's exciting to you, um, cancer biology is, is a great field. And I also think that it's, I think anybody can do it. Like, I think there's this idea that, oh, you have to be really scientifically minded. It's honestly about perseverance. It is about like, what are, you know, if you're excited about this and you want to help people and you have an interest in biology, like you can do this, you can get an MD, you can get a PhD, you can do all of these things. You don't have to, you can be a part of this field without graduate degrees. Absolutely. But if you put your mind to it, you absolutely can do it. Um, you just need to, you know, take the appropriate classes in, in college, basically, even if you haven't taken everything you need to in high school. Um, and I think that kind of leads into the next question. Um, in high school, I took, I went to, like I said, I went to a really small high school. So I took like two AP classes. My school did not offer AP biology. They didn't offer AP chemistry. So I didn't take either of those courses, but I really loved biology and chemistry. Um, so I took all the classes that I could. And then I did an independent study at the hospital, like I told you. Um, basically, I took bio, chem, physics, and math to prepare me um, to study biology in college. Um, in college, I took, I had to take a semester of physics and a semester of math, which were not my favorite, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> I took intro chemistry and organic chemistry, which was also required for my biology major. Um, I took intro biology, and that's something I want to point out to people that I for, for Bowdoin, you basically take this placement test when you go in. So I didn't take AP bio because it wasn't offered. I tested like on the border for intro bio of whether I could take sort of an accelerated one semester or if I wanted to take intro biology spread out over two semesters. And I chose to do it over two semesters because I knew this is what I wanted to study and I wanted a really solid foundation. And I would give that advice to anyone. I think that was a really good decision that I didn't realize at the time would be so impactful. But I think there is a there is an, a sense that maybe, okay, if I want to do this, I need to do this as quickly as possible. I need to take all the hardest classes. I need to take the accelerated track. But I'm here to tell you that it's it really is more about what you're learning and, and how much you can stick with it and how much you get out of your courses, both in high school and in college. Um, so I would recommend to anyone, if you have the opportunity to sort of take more of that introductory, like that solid base of what you need to build your knowledge um, off of, I would highly recommend that you, that you take um, those classes. In terms of biology classes, um, the way that Bowdoin works, it's a small liberal arts school. Um, so I, I got a degree in biology, but I mostly focused on cellular and molecular biology. So I took, um, I took developmental bio, I took genetics, I took a class called molecular ecology and evolution. The way that they work, they have like three different groups of, of biology classes. You had to take like one class from each group. One was like ecology, um, one was molecular bio, and then there was like cell bio. So I took mostly cellular and molecular biology classes, um, but I took one ecology class. <clears throat> and then my senior year, I took an immunology class and I absolutely fell in love with it. Just, I, I knew we all had immune systems. I, that was about the extent of it, right? I didn't really understand what they did. And I, I won't go too much into detail about it, but <laughs> I fell in love with this idea that your immune system is constantly working for you it's, you know, it is obviously helping you when you're sick, right? It's, it's getting you healthy. It's fighting off bacteria. It's fighting off viruses, but it's also working around the clock when you don't feel sick and it's keeping you healthy and it has to find this sort of perfect balance. And if you don't have a strong enough immune system and you're immunosuppressed, you're sort of more likely to develop something like cancer because your immune system can sort of like surveil for the development of cancer and, and help your body. And then the flip side of that, you would think like, okay, great. We want a really aggressive immune system. If you go too much on the other side and you fall out of that really nice balance, you can develop an autoimmune disease, which is a group of diseases where your immune system attacks your own body. So we don't want that. We only want that in the context of cancer 
which is still your own body, right? <laughs> so it's this, it's this kind of convoluted, like, how do we sort of throw off the balance in the setting of cancer, but we don't want to throw off the balance at any other time. So I just thought that was really cool, um, which is why I decided to study how the immune system interacts with cancer, because I knew I was really interested in cancer biology. And then I got more specific in college because trust me, I also did not know what immunology was um, up until my senior year of college. So I'm glad you're bringing yeah. this up, Selena, because you know one of the things that um, in talking to a lot of uh, college and students, um, and I think just students in general, you know, that are in high school that are, you know, really considering their major for college is that they they there's this like pressure that they have to figure it all out before they go yeah. to college and yeah. they have to know exactly what they're going to study and what made, you know, what major they're going to like have in their classes. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think it's, it's so refreshing to, to hear from, you know, somebody like you that that's, you know, at Duke, that's, you know, having all the success and didn't necessarily figure it out until well after you, you, you step foot at, at Bowdoin. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that. I like to think, I mean, I can tell you what worked for me, but I think one of the things, one of the ways that I like to think about this, the context in which I like to think about sort of career progress and development is I'm, a, like I said, I'm a huge fan of having this mission statement of sort of reflecting on what you want out of your career. Again, for me, what I found fulfilling was helping people. And I knew that was going to be in the context of cancer. I sort of like narrowed that down, but I have always sort of had this idea. And again, this is just what worked for me, um, that I was going to follow what I was excited and passionate about. And so I had a plan based on what I was excited and passionate about. And I've had this idea that, you know, if something else comes up and I am more excited and more passionate about that direction, then I'm going to follow it. And I can always go back, right? Like nobody can take the experiences, the amount that you've learned, the classes you took, the people that you met, like nobody can take that from you. So if you're sitting here going, I might like cancer biology, I don't know, I like bio, but I don't really know how I can apply that. Great, go in with the idea of cancer bio and that's great and take your classes. And if you, you know, if you take something else, you say, wow, ecology is unbelievable. Like I, what an amazing way to apply biology and my interests and maybe I can help the environment. And you decide that's something you're more passionate about then follow that, right? You can apply this in many different ways. And I don't necessarily see this as changing your plan so much as refining and also just sort of like adding these things in. I think it's it's additives more so than like fully changing direction, uh, if that makes sense. So Totally. We have a lot of questions uh, that have come through here. And so awesome. I, I know we're, we're, we're actually at about the um, 20 minute mark uh, left here. So mm -hmm. about 22 minutes. So these are gonna be kind of rapid fire. Uh, if that's okay, okay, I'm ready. And then we'll jump into the, the next slide. Um, so yep. Sarah had a question, and, and this is actually not in the Q&A, but uh, what were some of the biggest obstacles during your journey in, um, uh, in your field and how did you overcome them? Wow, that's a great question. Um, rapid fire, I got to answer quicker. Okay, I think <laughs> right now, um, I would say the biggest obstacle is just, it's being a PhD student is tough and it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of hard work, it takes a lot of things that don't work, like I said. And so I think that just this um, resilience and persistence, and that's sort of why I said, I, I truly genuinely believe that anybody can do it. If you can get through these classes, if you can you know, study and put your mind to it, like you, you can do it. It's a matter of, um, of sticking with it. So I think that's a huge, that was a, that's been a huge challenge for me. Um, and I think, in undergrad, honestly, there were just some classes that were really challenging. Um, I, I think that I'm a, you know, at this point, I think I am a good researcher. I think I have a really exciting project. I think my, my goal is that my project is going into the clinic to help patients. But I will tell you, I really struggled in some of my classes. Um, not because I wasn't studying, not because I wasn't putting the time in, they were just hard. I just, you know, I just struggled. And so I think overcoming the challenge of, you know, if I'm going to do this for my career, this should come easy and I should be good at this. No, if you're excited about it, go get help, you know, go to the, we had a center for learning and teaching, go to your professor, go to your TAs, 
go to the study center, get a friend and talk about it. Like they all you have can office hours. It. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, yeah, just, just overcoming some of those challenges for sure. Yeah, no, that's a uh, great advice there. Um, how important is AI machine learning and related computer technologies in your field? Great question. Um, I don't do too much with AI. I think computer technology, there is a huge movement in cancer biology toward sort of bioinformatics and big data. Um, my project has not focused as much on that, but there is what we call single cell sequencing. So we basically look at the RNA, um, which is kind of like DNA for those of you who know, uh, kind of looking at the genes and, and their products um, from thousands and thousands, well, tens of thousands of cells and getting a whole bunch of information from that. So you can imagine it's a ton of data and you have to sort of sift through that. So that's a huge part of the field now. And I think I would say that people with um, sort of computer programming or big data um, backgrounds can be very, very effective um, bioinformaticians and cancer biologists. And a lot of times um, we've seen bioinformaticists and um, cancer biologists partner and collaborate. And I think now the field is moving toward um, that maybe being one person as well. So I think if you're interested in big data and computer programming, which I have very little background in, this would be a phenomenal field for you to get into if you're interested. Yeah. Uh, our next question, uh, and I just want to make sure that I, I'm, I'm understanding this correctly. So okay. the uh, for a student that is maybe new to cancer biology, what are some yeah topics uh, of research that they could focus on, you know, sort of higher level yeah. um, types of, of, of topics. Hopefully, uh, Hima, hopefully I'm asking the, the question correctly. Yeah, I think if you're, if you're just starting out and you're interested in cancer biology and you're like, what do I Google? What do I look at, right? I think thinking about how cancer develops and why is one whole side of the field that I think is really interesting. Um, I'm biased, obviously, but I think how the immune system interacts with cancer is another side. And then I think just what types of treatments are out there for cancer and what, you know, things like chemotherapy, things like radiation, things like immunotherapy. Um, what does that look like? I would say those are the big three things that I would, that I would look into. Yeah, good question. Um, and then we have uh, two more quick questions here. And then there's one that I think okay. we can get to uh, towards the end here. Um, if a student were to do a research paper with polygens, where would they get the data if yeah. it weren't from a lab experiment? Yeah, great question. So CJ and I were talking about how a lot of our students with cancer biology and the students that I've had have done review papers. And so what that means just quickly is that um, a lot of people put out what we call primary research papers. So it's a summary of like, I did all these experiments. This is what I found. And then there are review papers where you read all of those primary papers and you say, here's where the field is as a whole. A bunch of people have done a bunch of experiments and this is what we found. And so I think um, in terms of the, the data for the research paper, um, when I work with my students, we look at um, other papers in the field and we sort of summarize what's going on in the field. And so the data would be from other scientific papers um, and then we write it in a way that answers a question that we come up with together. I also want to um, sort of, in terms of review papers, I know that sometimes yeah. students get a little bit, uh, not, they just get, feel kind of down that it's not like they're, you know, they're in a lab coat and they're in a you know, research lab that it's, you know, they're not able to do that, that a, a you know, review paper seems kind of like, I don't know, just, just yeah. not that exciting. But yeah, what it's I, not, it doesn't seem as cool. <laughs> it doesn't seem as cool, but I will say that, you know, it, especially if it's the first or even second time you've done research, the ability to synthesize, you know, I don't know how many papers, <laughs> how many so important. your students are, but if you're able to it's do so that, important. I'm telling you that like, it's, that is an incredibly important skill mm -hmm. for college um, to synthesize, yeah. um, you know, 20 or 30 papers into uh, a cogent paper. It's just, it's mm -hmm. really such an, an important skill. And if you can do that, then experimental research, then you, you can, you can do experimental research. So. Absolutely. I would, I would also add, this is something, you know, if you are interested in research, like this is something you will do throughout your career. 
I just wrote a review paper on something. This isn't something where we say, well, you can't do a primary paper, you're gonna write a review. Like this is something that happens actively in the field. We do this all the time. And honestly, if I wanna learn something new, I go to a review paper to learn that. And I think the other side of it, I'm very passionate about science communication. I'll be quick on this, but I think that's another huge, huge, huge skill. If you are interested in science in any capacity, learning to communicate your ideas is invaluable because when you're writing those grants, if you wanna have your own lab, when you're trying to convince funders to, you know, come walk through my lab, let me show you this. When you're at scientific conferences and you're presenting your work, you need to be able to, to do that in a way that's accessible to a wide variety of people. And that's something that we focus on in these review papers. And it's, it's critical in the setting of science, but it's also critical in college in a number of ways, right? If you can have an idea clearly in your head, but you can't put it on paper, which I really have struggled with in the past and have worked on quite a bit, um, it, it's gonna be difficult to write, you know, your those college essays and things like that. So I think there's a lot of things that you can learn from the review paper. Absolutely. Yeah. I was gonna say that if you can do a review paper with Polygens, that English 101 <laughs> class, your freshman year, oh, you are fine. Degrees, that Absolutely. is gonna be super easy. I tell you mm -hmm. how many, I can't tell you how many people struggled with English 101. Um, yeah. At, at university. So I do want to jump in and there's a couple more questions here, but um, I yeah. think those are questions that we can leave towards the end there. But sure. um, I want to jump into mentorship and how important mentorship um, has been for you, Selena. So if yeah. you would, can you talk a little bit about um, just your um, mentor experience, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, anyone that's impacted you um, sure. uh, along your journey here? Yeah, I included these two pictures, um, these two scientists who have been really impactful for me. Um, Laura Getchell from my high school up in Maine um, was an absolutely phenomenal teacher. She got me excited about biology. She was is probably the best science communicator I've ever met. She made really um, sometimes annoying and complex, you know, cell signaling pathways and things about the cell seem like you know, she would relate them to everyday things that we knew about. And, and I was always so excited and passionate about um, learning more in her classes. And so I think she has been a huge mentor for me, just in terms of the way that she got me excited about biology. And I would go in, um, honestly, I would go in at lunch and talk to her about things, both like life and biology related, and just having that support and having someone um, recognize your interests and take the time to sort of invest in you as a person and also as a scientist has been phenomenal. And I think I had that again um, in, in college. I didn't include a picture for here, but I had a professor in college, um, Anne McBride, who was my immunology professor and my intro bio professor. Um, and she was known as one of the most difficult professors. She was a tough grader. People were a little bit scared of her classes. And I'll tell you, she's one of the kindest, most thoughtful, um, scientists and people that I've ever met. And I ended up doing my senior thesis project with her. So don't shy away from those professors because typically they they want you to succeed and they just want to push you to see what you can do. And I'm really grateful for her and her support. She went over my thesis project with me. She sat and talked about um, you know, what types of classes I was taking. She agreed to be my advisor when my advisor left. And she really was, again, invested in me as a person and as a scientist. And then I went to Mass General and I worked for Marcella Moss, um, who was an absolute phenomenon in our field and has done amazing research and her lab has really taken off, but she cared really deeply about the people in her lab and she wanted to make sure that they felt supported. And, you know, while, while also, um, you know, training for scientists and making sure that people have the resources that they need. So I think the common thread here is that people are supportive and invested in you, both as a person and also as a scientist. So invested in your career and also your sort of mental and emotional well-being. And I think that's really important, um, you know, in in your career, especially in um, moving toward graduate school. I think I think having people that you can go back to and and talk to is really important. I'm also glad that you brought up this idea of like sometimes the mentors that you wouldn't think you would necessarily like work well with that yeah. maybe, you know, oh, I could just 
have a mentor where they'll just let me coast and I won't have to like work that hard or whatever. It, yeah. You find that mentor that really pushes you and it really, it makes such a difference. It really, really yeah. does. Um, so it's like the I'm saying, so glad, right. Yeah. When you're, when you're playing sports and they say, you know, if coach is yelling at you, it means yeah. they, they're invested in you. Right. And it's when they're silent totally. and they're not talking to you that it's problematic. So your mentor really should be highly invested in both your success academically and also just, you know, how you're managing as a, as an individual as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and one of the questions I have is about why you became a Polygen's mentor. Yeah, another great question. I think <laughs> I, so I had never experienced anything like Polygen's when I was in high school. Obviously it wasn't around then because I'm kind of old, but I think just the idea of, of being able to um, meet with students who were excited and also be able to share my passion with them. It makes me very excited about my field when I get to see younger students who are experiencing um, some of these realizations and and seeing sort of the big questions of our field and seeing how they might be able to make an impact, sort of seeing that click for them for the first time and remembering how that felt for me and sort of that reminds me why I do what I do. Um, and so I think it's personally very fulfilling for me. And then also just being able to give back to students, right? So like I I had help when I was in, in high school and college, like I just talked about, I had mentors who were invested in me and talked to me about their career paths and, and helped me get to where I wanted to go. I had this sense of like, of purpose and, and what I wanted to do. And I think um, it wasn't often that sort of the, the red carpet was laid out, if you will, like there wasn't always a very clear path as to how I could get there. But I reached out and these people really helped me find opportunities and, and get me to where I am today. And so I think I want to do that for other people. And it's been really, um, really fulfilling seeing students, you know, just, just sort of have that light bulb moment of like, oh my gosh, you know, this, these questions are so interesting. Like, this is what I think I want to do. I just had a student who said she was interested in research and she also thought she wanted to see patients. And I said, have you ever heard of an MD PhD? And she didn't know that that was a career option. Right. And so I think just expanding the, the horizons of what is possible and knowing, you know, what's out there and what's exciting and knowing that everything is available to you, being able to be a part of that is, is exciting to me. I have a rapid fire question yeah. for you real quick. Okay. Um, I'm ready. How do you manage um, students that are mentees mm -hmm. that don't feel confident in their abilities because this is a very Great common question. challenge that we have here at Polygens. Um, even though the students that we have are so like incredibly bright and, and hardworking. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to preface this by saying, I don't know how many students are on here, but I am blown away by what our students can do. Um, I, I There's no way I could do this in high school. <laughs> like I, I was not at this place. Like I obviously I didn't do a Polygens project, but I, I probably could have done it, but I wasn't in a place where I was designing my own projects. Like I'm just floored by what these students do and what they're capable of. And I think for me as a mentor, um, I, I like to, I, I like to establish very early on that we're on the same side, that we are on a team, that we're working together, that we're learning together because I don't have all the answers, right? I am an expert in my field, but the, the minute that I think I have all the answers, we're in trouble, right? Whether in my PhD or whether as a mentor, like if someone tells you, I know all the answers, that's probably not a great mentor, right? You want somebody who's going to learn and grow with you and support you. And so I think I just try to make that clear to my students that I'm here to help you. You designed this project. You came in for a reason, right? You didn't just happen to fall into polygens, right? You applied here for a reason. You came in with something that you were excited or passionate about. And so my goal is to help foster that excitement and to help you get to wherever you want to go, right? Whether it's it's less of a focus on, you know, we have to get this paper published and more, what are you excited about? And what can we talk about? And how can I support you um, in that? And so I, I kind of just reiterate that to my students quite a bit. And I tell them, you know, I'm a huge fan of asking questions. So I always say, you know, at any time you can interrupt me if I'm, if, if something isn't clear, if you have questions about the text, like we're, we are on the same side and we're working together. 
So I hope it works. <laughs> I think it works. <laughs> Awesome, great stuff. There's a couple more questions here. Um, okay, uh, we'll, we'll go rapid fire format here, and then there's actually one more slide, but um, we only have uh, about five minutes left. So, cool. um, so a question from Alina here is: If a high school student wanted to contact you to ask to shadow you, for example, as a professional, what yeah. would you like to see in their email or message? Wow, that's a really thoughtful question. Okay, um, I think I would want to see. The first thing I would want to see is just like a reason why they want to do this. Um, and then I think a reason why they reached out to me specifically. So I know I've I've interviewed people for labs before, and those are the two things we look for. I would also say if you can, don't write like eight paragraphs about it. Be very short and sweet. I am absolutely someone who used to just like write paragraphs and that's not the move. So I think just something like, you know, I'm really interested in X, Y, or Z. Like I saw that you work here. I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about what you do. I'm looking for opportunities to shadow in the lab or something like that. Um, yeah, but definitely why you're excited and, and why you wanna do this. I also What's would the... say, don't be afraid to reach out. The worst people yeah. can do is say no, like no harm, no foul. Bullet points are your friends or yeah. um, brevity. Brevity is your friend. Yeah, so, and even short, if you short... can't, even if you can't shadow, maybe you have a cool conversation with somebody, you know? Yeah, you never know. I mean, it, it's funny how that one conversation that, that um, uh, you know, prospective mentor says, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have anybody or I don't have any room available mm -hmm. for this summer, but maybe next summer in the spring, yeah. uh, there's an opportunity. So you just never know um, just by asking. Absolutely. Um, the second question here uh, was from Sarah, and she asked, um, how do you personally combat lack of motivation? And so Ooh. I actually I actually sort of clarify that. And she said, um, yeah. you sort of uh, lack of motivation for the field that you're working in. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't think I've experienced a lack of motivation for cancer biology because I've had a lot of experiences. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, expand on that in a second, because it sounds like kind of an annoying answer. But I think the actual field, um, I have interacted with many cancer patients. Right now, I am on rotations. I don't treat patients. But part of my training is to go into the cancer center and rotate through the clinics so that I as a researcher who's at the bench and working with my cells and working with my animal models can see what these patients are going through every day. So I really don't feel like I have lost motivation for the field ever. I think if anything, it's stronger than ever that like, we really need to do something to help these patients. Um, in terms of motivation in general, I think, you know, stuff can get challenging. Um, it can get frustrating. You can lose motivation. And I think just, I rely on taking a, taking a deep breath and like trying to take a, a little bit of time for myself. And like CJ said, I think there's, there's the individual with a personal aspect to things. And so how can I take care of myself as an individual? And then how can I be the best scientist um, that I can? And and I need to get back to it if I have a long day or something like that. Like I'm I'm doing that because I'm trying to help these patients. So at the end of the day, like, yeah, it may not be ideal for me to be in lab for 12 hours, but it's less ideal for them to be dealing with this disease. And so you know what? That 12 hour day is nothing. Like you you can get in the lab and you can be okay. Um, so I think that's kind of the the context that I think about things. Yeah, that's great. Great advice there. Um, so uh, one last question here uh, about uh, actually polygens um, in general. And sure. can a student in their freshman year in high school attempt research at polygens? Um, I can actually kind of partially answer this question. Yeah, but essentially we, we have definitely had a lot of students, both eighth, ninth and even ten, you know, 10th graders as well that have joined us here at polygens to do a research mm -hmm. paper. Um, the one caveat that I always say is that for a, especially for a freshman, if you're basing or like comparing your writing to somebody who is an 11th or 12th grader, um, it can seem kind of overwhelming, like, oh, I'm, I'm incapable of doing that because my writing skill is not at that level, um, which is entirely untrue or it is in terms of, it doesn't mean mm -hmm. that you cannot do research. It just means that maybe it's not going to be, you know, quite that same level that, um, uh, you know, somebody with a little more experience has, but uh, absolutely, we've we've had a lot of students uh, here at Polygen that enroll with us, um, even as young as uh, at seventh grade. So, 
it's also about what you're excited about and your learning experience. So don't worry about how it compares to other people because they're coming from different academic backgrounds. You know, it's about you as an individual. Absolutely. Um, so we are technically at time and we, we kind of missed out on a slide here, but I guess it just if we have like one last thing, yeah. um, I guess one last question, what advice would you give to a student looking to sort of start, you know, get that, that first, you know, foot in the door uh, in the field of cancer biology? Uh, don't say no to opportunities, be open to them and just keep going. Like they're going to come your way. And I think just take the classes that you're interested in and continue pursuing something that you're passionate about and do not let the this is sort of general advice, but again, do not let this voice of, of like, I don't know if I can do this. This class is hard. It's supposed to be easy for me. Like if you're passionate about this, I promise you, you can do it. So just keep going and, and it sounds a little bit cliche, but don't, don't give up. Cause I promise that you can do it. <laughs> awesome. Speaking of opportunities, if you are interested in joining us here at Polygence uh, and doing a research project, um, if you are registered, all you have to do is go to polygens.org, click on my account or where it says login, and then complete your polygens application. Or if you still have questions um, about polygens or uh, just you know the different programs that we offer here, um, you can of course reach out to me directly. My email address is cj at polygens.org. Um, and I'm happy to jump on a call with um with anybody to, to answer questions. You can also just email me those questions as well. Um, or if you wanna meet with an admissions representative to formally uh, kickstart the process of getting enrolled. I'm actually glad to see that we have a couple of students who've already enrolled that are, have joined us uh, to uh, learn a little bit more about cancer biology, so. Can I add something super quickly? Sure, absolutely. Please be. Sorry, I'll be I'll be brief. But we talk, <laughs> I've been thinking about it as you said. You know, it's a little bit different doing a polygens project and doing a review project versus putting on a lab coat and being in the lab. But I want to reiterate something that I didn't make super clear during this. I would say ninety percent of research is about thinking and understanding science and asking the right questions and understanding what questions are important and how they help people. Like truly, that's ninety percent of my job. Doing the experiments, great. That's what looks cool, right? But it's not the vast majority of it. And so I think that's what we focus on here. So I, you can Love get it. a really cool and exciting project out of this. Totally, totally. And, and the best part is that you can really customize the topic that you want to focus on, whether it's cancer yeah. biology or sports analytics. Literally, we have just so many students that are doing different, you know, so many different topics here at Polygen. So um, that is all I have. I would just want to uh, one sort of um, pitch here for next Wednesday. Um, we are uh, going to continue our AMA series uh, Wednesday, April 5th, same time, uh, same location, uh, Zoom. <laughs> uh, topic will be psychology with um, uh, Tatiana Bustos, um, who'll be talking about uh, youth development and just the psychology field. Selena, thank you so much for um, Absolutely. joining My us pleasure. tonight. So appreciate it. Um, and again, if My you have pleasure. any questions, um, uh, please reach out to me, cj at polygens.org. Um, but otherwise, have a great evening. Have a great evening, everybody. Bye, everyone. <laughs>